good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us online today. Uh, we are the Science Basement. We are an organization from the University of Helsinki, where we basically offer a platform for young researchers that want to start communicating with the general public more. Uh, so these are our usual afternoons in the Science Basement. This is the first time that we have them completely virtual, because they generally happen in Tiede Kulma, and uh, it's like an in-person event, but uh, today we are kindly hosted by Terco. And uh, um, yes, this is one of the activities that we usually organize. Uh, we also do write blog posts and have podcasts. So if you are a researcher interested in any of this form of communication or you want to suggest a new one, uh, please do be in contact. And uh, if you're someone that is not a researcher, you're very welcome to be here with us today. Um, just a couple of things before we get started with our speaker today. So uh, since the event is virtual, uh, we still want to have the Q&A session at the end. So we have a Presemo link, uh, presemo.helsinki.fi slash brain plasticity, all uh, lowercase. And uh, the, the link will be active throughout the whole talk, but we will ask all the questions at the end. And uh, one more thing is um, if you want, if you like the event and you want to hear more about the activities that we organize, uh, please do leave us your email. Uh, we will uh, post a Google form at the end of the event in Facebook. So you can just leave us your email. We spam very little. So um, yes. But without further ado, today is all about brain plasticity, and I very welcome our speaker today, who is Giuliano Di Dio, a uh, researcher from the University of Helsinki, and uh, he can tell you more about our brain. <coughs> thank you very much, Chiara, and thank you very much to the, to the science basement for this, for this opportunity. So yeah, I am... Giuliano, and I am uh, about to finish my third year of PhD studies at the Neuroscience Center in Professor Erica Edocaston's laboratory. I started, I, I decided to start studying the brain because I was interested in understanding how the brain works. Now, after two years of master's and two years of PhD, I can finally say with a certain degree of pride that I have still have no idea whatsoever how the brain works, but I am getting more and more interested in how the brain changes. You've probably all heard sentences like, oh, it's so easy to learn things when you're a child, or uh, I wish I was good at learning as when I was younger, or things like, things like these. But what do they actually mean? Like, biologically, what do they refer to? So in order to answer, try to answer these questions, um, let's focus now on what scientists have now agreed on being the coolest organ in the human body. No discussion accepted on this point. Uh, so the brain is made of these tiny, tiny little components called neurons. Now, a, neur a typical neuron is made in this way. You have this central ball in the center, which is the main body of the neuron. It's where all the inner organs of the neurons are. And then they present these funny looking weird protrusions. So all the neurons in our brain are connected to each other through these protrusions uh, with which they touch themselves, they get in contact with themselves. Thousands and thousands of these connections that you can imagine like electric wires that the neurons use to communicate with each other. These connections are what make us move, think, feel, and learn. And these connections are not even fixed. They like to change and rearrange themselves. They can get pruned away if they turn out to be quite useless. They can be strengthened if they turn out to be really useful. Or new connections can be made all together if needed. Every time we learn something new, new connections are strengthened or made, other connections are pruned away in order to create a newly formed network that lies behind the new skill acquired. And this is what we define neural plasticity. 
Well, plasticity refers to this quality of an object of being able to change its shape into something else and, importantly, stay that way. Our brain does, can and does this all the time, but not always at the same rate. You, some of you might have heard of a concept called critical period. It is a time window during our early life, years of life, where our brain is particularly good at rewiring itself. As children, we take up everything very quickly. Uh, we learn immediately how to use our body. We learn how to walk. Uh, a language, done. A second language, done. Playing the piano, done. As we age, this, the plasticity of, of our brain sl slowly goes down. And as we become adults, it becomes more and more difficult to make change in the, in the network. Of course, we never lose it completely. We're always able to learn. But it becomes more and more difficult. And of course, mind you, there are events and experiences that are able to efficiently, quickly make plastic changes in your adult brain. But those are only the highly emotional, stressful, and some, sometimes traumatic events. And we, we'll go back, that, uh, back there later on. So this system usually works fairly well. When you're, when, you, when you're young, your brain just quickly gets all the skills that it needs to survive, and then once it gets it got everything that it needs, um, it just locks them, uh, it just locks them up so that you won't forget them, and then you just, you're just ready to go. Now, I know that at first sight, this um, high plasticity, low plasticity system might sound a bit counterintuitive, but I think that if you bear with me for a second, I can try to make sense of it. Let's, let's play in a small role-playing game. Imagine you were a newborn gazelle. You open your eyes for the first time in your life to see the vast savanna around you. You are, have been brought on this world full of predators and dangers of all kind with very little notice. You need to learn how to survive ASAP. You don't have time. You need immediately to learn what's good and what's not. You need to learn immediately who are your parents, and most importantly, you need to learn how to recognize a lion ASAP. Well, luckily for you, you have a brain that is amazingly fast at doing that, just waiting to get all the inputs it can to create the best surviving machine. In very little time, you get all the skills you need to avoid dying in a horrible, horrible way. Very easily, you, you, you immediately learn who are your parents. You learn that grass is yummy. And hopefully, you learn that sh you should always, always run from a lion. So starting from a very counting and basic bundle of connections, your brain has immediately started to prune away the useless connections, strengthening the useful one, creating new ones if needed, in order to give you the best surviving machine. OK, now you are. You have a young brain, perfectly wired for survival in the savanna. Now, you really don't want to lose these precious connections. You don't want to forget how to recognize a lion just because you don't happen to see one for six days in a row. So your brain, after a while, locks itself, stiffening and hardening those precious connections, protecting them from any other major change but with the cost of making it more difficult for other connections to be created. You had your time window during which you shaped your brain through experience and practice, but now, once you've got all your gazelle skills, the critical period is over, and those connections are now permanent. In order to understand this concept of Consolidate, consolidating the good connection and hardening, I decided to use an analogy that wasn't invented by me. And unfortunately, I cannot remember who told me this analogy. So I'm just going to give the responsibility to an unknown person. I know that I didn't come up with this analogy, but I think it's just, it's just beautiful. Imagine it this way. You go, you go skiing, right? And you find yourself in front of this beautiful, snow slope full of untouched 
and fresh snow. There's no path, no trail, nothing. You can decide to go wherever you want. So you make a decision, you get a direction, and you start walking. Of course, the first time you walk through this fresh snow, you create a, a first trail, fairly visible at the beginning. And then you do the same path again, and again, and again. And the trail becomes deeper and deeper, until that trail is basically the only way that you can take. And it becomes very easy to take always the same way. By all, at the same time, it becomes very difficult to deviate. This is somehow, I think it's a good analogy to imagine how this consolidation and hardening of the used connection works. So hopefully, I managed to give you a good idea of why this system usually works fairly well. But here's a catch. What if something happens unexpectedly during the critical period? What if something bad and important happens when your brain is so plastic and receptive? Childhood, childhood trauma. Or one of those events that I mentioned that are highly emotional and highly stressful, and they are actually able to make plastic changes even in your adult brain, all these experiences might force your brain into creating bad connections that maybe for the moment were actually appropriate, but that later on, when they get consolidated, as the plasticity goes down, they might become problematic and damaging. Once the plasticity is, is down, those connections, good or bad, are there to stay. Major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic anxiety, are just some examples of many psychiatric diseases that are thought to rely on wrongly wired connections in the brain. And of course, we do have treatments and therapies for these diseases, but they usually just help you in coping with the disease. They don't eradicate the disease for good. It's very difficult to eradicate those bad connections for good. The brain is just not plastic anymore. How can you fix a brain? if the brain is locked? Well, in 2008, a bunch of scientists managed to show that, managed to show that it, there is a possibility to reopen the critical period in adult brain using a compound that is widely used still today. Some of you might know it as Prozac. Uh, for the ones who don't know Prozac, it's a very common antidepressant drug, which means it's used to treat depression. So in this experiment, in this experiment, the authors used a rat model of amblyopia, which is basically the lazy eye. And it is a condition where the visual cortex, which is the part of the brain that allows you to see things, starts focusing only on one eye rather than both of them. So very simply put, it works like this. So this is a mouse, and it's in the critical period, so a very young mouse. And this is its um, visual cortex. And it, when the mouse is healthy and both eyes are healthy, the visual cortex gets inputs from both eyes. Now, of course, during the critical period, these projections are very mature. But if the eyes are healthy and the mouse is healthy, by the time the mouse is an adult, then the visual cortex end up being nicely organized and packed getting equal projection equally from both eyes. But if something happens during the critical period, so for example, if you close one eye during, uh, of a young mouse so during its critical period, the visual cortex is still highly plastic, and it will adapt by starting to ignore the projections from the closed eye, because there are no inputs from it, and start focusing only on the only open eye. Once the critical period is closed, even if you open the other eye, the visual cortex is locked in that configuration, and the mouse will stay amblyopic. However, and this is what the researchers did, if you do the same experiment, so you take a mouse and you make it amblyopic by closing one eye during the critical period, the mouse as adult will be amblyopic, but if you open the eye and close the good one, and at the same time treat the mouse with Prozac, then what the researchers saw was that you actually do get a change. 
the visual cortex is able then to rearrange itself and get back into the healthy configuration as if the critical period was still open. So somehow, Prozac made the brain as plastic as it was during the critical period, allowing changes that would have been possible only during the critical period. Then closing, sorry, closing the good eye was enough to drive the brain into the configuration that we wanted. Now, and this is the important part. Prozac itself was not enough. What worked is the combination between the drug, Prozac, and the closure of the good eye. Because you see, opening the plasticity doesn't necessarily treat or cure anything. Once the brain is plastic again, it wouldn't change anything until it feels the need for it. So by closing the good eye, the visual cortex, now plastic because of the drug, will feel the need to start focusing less on the, on the closed eye because there's no inputs coming from it and start focusing a bit more on the open eye, which was the one ignored previously. And that's not it. The researchers in the same study also managed to give evidences for the involvement of what we consider nowadays the main actor in, in, in activating plasticity in the brain. A molecule that when activated switches on plasticity. Let me introduce you to Mr. Truckby. I, I apologize for no vowels in the name. It's not my fault. The pronunciation is Truckby. No need for Mr. We don't use the word Mr. We're quite close. So, um, Truckby is thought to be the kind of the trigger, the switch for plasticity. And all neurons, most of the neurons in our brain seem to uh, carry this molecule. And when track B is activated, so when the switch is on, that neuron is now more open or prone to make plastic changes. The track B is usually activated in response to a specific chemical message sent by other neurons. So when the brain decides that for some reason it, it needs to change its connections, the neurons start sending each other this chemical message, telling each other to activate track B so in response to the message, track B is activated, and click, the plasticity is on, and those neurons will start now changing those connections depending on the need. So in that research that I just mentioned to you, the, the authors managed to show that somehow Prozac managed to activate this very switch, track B, therefore activating the plasticity in the brain. This had huge implications, not only because, as I said, it was showing that this drug would allow the reopening of a critical period that we only see in young animals, but also because it gave a hint on how antidepressants might actually work. Now, as I said before, uh, Prozac is an antidepressant drug, it means it's used to treat depression. Now, for years, we thought we knew how antidepressant worked, the main theory was that Prozac interacted with the chemical in our brain called serotonin and therefore improving our mood. But this theory alone did not fit perfectly with some of the observations that scientists were making about depression and antidepressants. However, this concept of Prozac being able to activate the brain's plasticity might suggest there might be something more to it than just serotonin. What scientists are now suggesting is that Prozac actually works by making the brain more plastic, therefore permissive to change. Then, through psychotherapy, you would then drive the brain, which is now plastic, into fixing those bad connections that got you sick in the first place. Another research, um, that used Prozac and basically obtained similar results and was actually made in Ero Castron's laboratory, so in the laboratory I work for. Um, Dr. Nina Karpova, she used a Prozac, she opened plasticity in a mouse model of post-traumatic stress disease, which is a severe mental illness that consists in a brain that as a consequence of a traumatic event starts activating the 
the alert, the emergency physiological responses of our body, like anxiety, trembling, um, sweating, in perfectly normal situations, making it very difficult for these patients to conduct um, a normal life. So in this model, the authors trained the mice to associate and to expect a small harmless foot electric shock after a sound cue, a beep, a beep sound. So after the mouse learned this association, it would be enough to just provide the beep, the beep sound, the sound cue, in order to see the mouse freeze, which is their behavior that you can see when they're scared, because they learned the association. Now, the thing is, if you do this experiment in young mice, so when the mice are highly plastic during their critical period, what you see is that you train the mice to expect uh, the small foot shock uh, in association to the sound cue, and then it is enough to repeatedly expose them only to the sound cue with no foot shock to see a slow, gradual, but permanent decrease in their fear reaction to the sound cue. Their critical period is still open, the brain is highly plastic, it just readapts and it rewires itself in order to break that connection that is now obsolete. But if you do the same experiment in adult mice, so the critical period is over, so you train the mice to expect an electric foot shock after a sound cue, and then even if you repeatedly provide only the sound cue without the foot shock, you do see a, a, a gradual improvement at the beginning, but in the long term, for example, if you expose them again just to the sound, no shock one week later, that fear response will spontaneously come back. And this is, what, this is kind of what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, a traumatic event, a war, an accident, one of these events that, because of their homo high emotional load, have the, the, the strength to create a plastic change in your brain, and then they create the connection with, with, with the emergency and alert response of your body, which for that specific moment when it got triggered, it might have even be appropriate, but then it keeps being on and activated even later on when the danger is no longer there. Now, if this happens, all, especially in, in adults, every attempt to train your brain that there's no danger will show some beneficial results in the short term, but in the long run those symptoms are very likely to come back. However, and I guess you, you know where I'm going by now, when these researchers did the exact same experiment, so they got adult mice and they trained them to expect an electric foot shock after a sound cue, and they repeatedly exposed them just to the sound cue and at the same time treated them with Prozac, what they saw was a, a gradual and permanent erasure of the fear response, exactly like if the critical fear was, was still open. So again, Prozac made the brain plastic and permissive to change, and then by exposing the mice just to the sound cue, this was enough to drive the brain into correcting those connections that, was, that were responding to a danger that was just no longer there. Now, many years have passed since these experiments, and uh, now the plasticity activation of antidepressant is a very well-known and very well-established and observed phenomenon in research, and actually many other compounds have been added to the list. But do not panic. Luckily, not everything that activates plasticity is a potentially dangerous drug. In fact, it has been suggested that also physical activity might have the same effects. Well, at least in mice. We're talking about research again. In fact, um, multiple papers by the same group, the first one in 2007 and the follow-up in, in 2014, if I remember correctly, managed to show that a stimulating environment and then through the follow-up also just voluntary physical exercise with the mouse model in a form of running wheel was able to activate plasticity in the visual cortex. Basically, they did the same experiment that I mentioned you at the beginning, the experiment about the lazy eye when you get the, you close the eye in the young mouse and then you try to fix it. What they saw was that if you create an amblyopic mouse by closing one eye during the critical period, again, the visual cortex will adapt to prefer the open one. Then, if when the researchers close the, uh, open the, the, the bad eye and close 
the good one, and expose the mice to voluntary physical exercise in the form of running wheel, they again saw reactivated plasticity in the visual cortex. Now, in this last part of the presentation, I would like to just tell you a little bit of what actually I am doing uh, in, during my PhD work. Um, you see, all this, I think it's quite amazing. We have several ways, pharmacological or not, to reactivate the brain's plasticity, allowing brain changes that would otherwise be impossible. But there's a limitation. Imagine, especially in research, right, you might not want to activate plasticity indefinitely everywhere. Right, in, like, look at, this is the 3D reconstruction of a mouse brain. So this is a mouse brain, right? Let's say there's a researcher, you are interested in studying plastic changes in this specific brain area, this green one. It's called the hippocampus. So I have several ways to activate plasticity. Let's say I choose Prozac, and I, pr I, I treat the mouse with Prozac, and then I look at the behavioral outcome. Now, problem is, whatever I see, how do I know that it's due to something that happened here? The whole brain received the compound. How can I exclude something that, for example, happened in this red part of the brain, which I might not be interested in? In Edo Castron's laboratory, we solved this problem by using light. We are using a version of the molecular switch for plasticity, Mr. Truckby, that actually activates in response to light. We call that opto Truckby. Opto, as from the Greek, I, I think, as in, you know, the truck bee that sees light. Uh, this compound was brought in our lab by a senior researcher, Dr. Juzo Memory, and this compound has, this version of truck bee, has the ability of activate itself, so activate plasticity, without the need of receiving that famous chemical messenger, just in response to blue light. So what we do is, of course, this is a, lab-made version of TRACB. TRACB usually does not respond to light, and importantly, neurons naturally do not carry this light-sensitive version of the switch. So we first have to deliver the molecule into the mouse brain area that we want in order to make those neurons. Now, the neurons are able to, they actually carry this opto TRACB, so this light-sensitive version of TRACB switch. So now these neurons are sensible, sensitive to light, and then, in order to deliver the light in that specific location, we surgically implant optic fibers into that same brain area. Then we connect the optic fiber to a LED, genera LED generator, and then we switch on the switch and click. Plasticity is on in that specific area. We have obtained a localized activation of plasticity. So now, through this technology, we can now study the effect of plastic changes changes in specific brain areas without having to worry about what happens in other brain areas. And personally, what I'm trying to do during my PhD, using this tool, which is, it is actually the main tool that I'm using during my work, is to understand, is to get a deeper understanding of which neurons are involved in these plastic changes and which neurons are doing what when the brain decides to change its mind. I just want to end with trying answering the question of why. Why are we doing all this? Well, I think that the easiest answer would be to just list some of the diseases that are thought either to rely on an impaired plasticity or that anyway would benefit from a targeted plastic reconnection and rewiring of the brain. Depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, addiction, stroke, highly debilitating conditions, widely spread across the world. If you, if you sum up all the people, the number of people affected by each disease, and you compare them to the actual world population, you see that one every eight people has been, is affected at least by one of these. Billions of dollars are spent every year trying to treat these diseases without actually fully cur uh, curing them. But the study and the use of active controlled plasticity might have the has the potential to fully treat these diseases by 
a, a localized and guided rewiring of those connections, those sick, bad connections that got you sick in the first place. And this is already a legit answer, I would say. However, to be honest, um, this is not the only reason why I'm doing this. It is, as I said at the beginning, I, you know, I started studying biology because I wanted to understand how the brain works, and now I'm just getting more and more interested in how the brain changes. If you think about it, it is fairly safe to suppose, imagine, that your brain is now different from the beginning of the talk. Now, hopefully you heard something new. But even just the memory of this event itself, any of these concepts are now encoded in your memory. So something very, very small must have changed. This is your brain, right? That something, where did it change? What changed? What neuron changed? How does it work? Can we control it? Understanding these things means to understand the biological mechanisms of learning, one of the highest features of our brain. And controlling it means to control the highest function of our brain. And to cure a lot of disease. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is the lab, the amazing lab that uh, just welcomed me and gave me the possibility to work on what, I, as I said, science already accepted being the coolest organ in, in, the human, in the human body. One last, if I may, one last shout out to any neuroscientist colleague out there listening to this talk. So a postdoc in our lab, Dr. Pino Casarotto, uh, involved many other, including myself, uh, members of the lab, of the, of the Aerocastrons Laboratory, in creating a free access, open access, and um, academic peer-reviewed peer academic journal entirely focusing on um, studies trying to reproduce other studies and mini review and commentaries on the topic of reproducibility in neuroscience. Um, so please, if you have any data, just hidden in that, in that drawer that you think are not publishable because they are not original, please do consider submitting them to our journal. and. Also, if you want to, we can help us in answering our short survey on how neuroscientists perceive reproducibility in their field. So just please follow the QR code and give us like two minutes to answer that survey. It would be really, really helpful to us. Thank you so much for your attention. I guess I can.